Until I was six, we lived in a farm in Northumberland. If you don't know where that is, basically head north and if you hit Scotland, you've gone too far. We had about 17 pets over the time that we lived there and they ranged from horses to goldfish. I had two and I changed their names every day. But what I really wanted was a dog. And so, when we moved back to London, we got one. I'm not sure why we didn't get one then, when we lived on an actual farm, but anyway. Her name is Indy. She's a rescue from Battersea Cats and Dogs Home. And we're not entirely sure of her age, but she's very playful, so we're assuming about two or three. Now, despite the fact that my dad was the one who wanted a dog the least, he now loves her more than anybody. The regular nighttime scenario in our house is this. My mum comes up to bed and Indy, or the dog as she's mostly known, is sleeping on her side of the bed with her head on her pillow. My dad is pretty much cheating on my mum at this point. But what I didn't learn until later is that it was partly through the recommendation of a psychologist that we got her. This is because my dad has seasonal depression. Now, my family isn't alone in this. One in four people have been diagnosed with a mental disorder at some point in their lives. As a way to treat some psychological problems, comfort animals are given to the patient. Comfort animals are any animal like my dog. Animal-assisted therapy has been going on for a very long time. We can trace it back to the ancient Egyptians who used to let dogs lick the feet of their wounded. Now, this seems pretty gross, but it turns out they had the right idea as dog saliva actually contains a number of antiviral and antibacterial compounds, as well as some growth factors to promote healing. The ancient Greeks used to use horses to lift patients' spirits by taking them into temples and letting them interact with the wounded. In the 1940s, the American Red Cross had a similar idea and worked in farms where veterans could come and interact and take care of farm animals when they were recovering from injuries. This was thought to comfort them and help them take their minds off the war. Horses have even been known to help people learn how to walk again through strengthening their core through bareback riding. Florence Nightingale describes in her book, A Notes on Nursing, her belief that small animals can decrease anxiety after she conducted a series of informal experiments where she gave small animals to children and noted their responses. Sigmund Freud used to bring his dog, Jophie, in sessions with him and noticed how the patient would be relatively stress-free when he was around. Later, a child psychologist, Boris Levinson, discovered that non-verbal children would actually speak to his dog. He used to ask them questions, but change his voice so it sounded like the dog was talking. And then the children would speak back to the dog. An example a bit closer to home is our school dog, Alfie, who is amazing in so many ways, from accompanying our school counselor to bereavement groups, to helping children make friends by taking him for walks. But why is it that this happens? The truth is, we don't really know. Scientifically, there is not a lot of research, although more is being done. One test does show the significant drop in stress hormones in a patient when they're around an animal. There is also the measurable effect that stroking a dog has on increasing your dopamine levels. But from a psychological point of view, is it because animals don't talk or judge? Is it because they provide unconditional love? Is that why people find it so easy to open up to them, especially children? The impact that my dog has had on my dad's life is undeniable. Having an animal that forces you out of the house, out of your own head, there is no medicine that helps him like she does. Indy was a rescue dog, but it was us who were rescued. <laughs>